So for this evening, I um, I thought that I would talk a little bit about uh, a little bit about the Buddha and his life. We we come together, we have like this unifying <clears throat> focus or uh, faith that draws us in that we have this idea of Buddha, the awakened one. We call, we call the religion that we're in, we call it Buddhism, which of course just means Awakening-ism, the teaching of awakening. And uh, one of the, the essences, the, the keys to understanding Buddhism is just this idea of, of waking up, this idea of um, being very brightly and and clearly and and, uh, and and totally awake and aware and knowing what is going on what what is what is my life what does my life mean what what is this what's happening now what are these feelings where does all this come from? What, what's actually where is the source of the suffering, the happiness in my life? And so we wake up to these things. And waking up to these things is uh, a potential or a capacity of, of what it means to be human. <clears throat> so in this sense, Buddhism is a, a humanistic religion. It's focused on uh, the human realm is our, is our point of reference. And we regard being born as a human as being a great uh, boon, a, an incredible benefit that somehow we can we can define ourselves, our humanity, in terms of this awakening, which gives us a reference point. We see the world from in here, from in our own, inside our own intelligence. Our own intelligence gives us is the window through which we see the world and we understand the world. And so the world is around us. We're centered in the world. When we look at, at the way different religions conceive about the world, then sometimes this is this kind of centrality of the human life is is made in a sense very literal. So people want to insist physically that, you know, of course, in the old cosmological conceptions, they believe that physically the Earth was the center of the universe, and that the you know the sun revolves around the Earth, and so on. And this is like imputing into a physical existence um, some kind of sense of of our own spiritual meaning. Buddhism has never done that. Okay, so Buddhism has never said that in, in any way the earth, our planet is special. We've always believed our planet is one of millions, billions, trillions of other uh, systems, world systems, planets, and is not special because of that. The specialness and the centeredness of our lives, the meaningfulness of our lives is the fact that within here, there is a vision of the world and a vision of the truth and that that is orientated from the center of our own consciousness. Now this is what gives our, our lives, each of our lives, meaning. You know, sometimes when, you, when you, 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 you lose that perspective, you just see the kind of the mass of humanity, six billion people crawling, swarming on our planet. 
we, 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 we begin to lose ourselves, we forget that we have any kind of sense of um, uh, individuality or, or uh, any sense of uh, who, who we are. We're like reduced to being just one of the swarm. <coughs> So the historical orientation, the historical center of Buddhism is not based around any uh, miracle. It's not based around any kind of cosmology which, which says that the world was created for us or for Buddhism or anything like that. It's centered around this act of awakening. And so when the Buddha awakened under the Bodhi tree, he saw the world from his perspective from inside his own consciousness and that that has a universal quality to it when we see the world we also see the world from our in, inside our own perspective and so there's this connection between our experience and the experience of the Buddha we too see out through these two eyes we too hear through these ears, through this nose, we smell, through this tongue we taste, through this body we feel, through this mind we think, we remember, we imagine. And by doing all of these things we're creating this world which is centered around our own hearts. So Buddhism by taking this kind of orientation uh, has created perhaps the original uh, world religion and historically one could make a very good case for saying that Buddhism was the original or the earliest of all religions to be spread out across a very wide range of the earth and the greater part for, for most of history um, it's, you know depending on how you want to look at it but for most of history quite possibly the greatest part of the civilized lands in the world were, were Buddhist or at least had a substantial Buddhist influence all the way from Persia in the west to Sri Lanka in the south to Mongolia in the north Japan and Indonesia in the east and all these, uh, this massive realm of, of uh, Buddhism. And so it's always incredibly uh, amazing to me how uh, a teaching which is based on impermanence, not self, suffering, conditionality, how we can take a teaching which is based on these things and then turn it into not just uh, something for philosophers to sit around and argue about, but turn it into a way of life that was meaningful for so many millions, hundreds of millions of people, billions of people, for such a long period of time. So one of the ways that Buddhism has done that is by uh, fixing and, and um, uh, idealizing the Buddhist conception of the world through the life of the Buddha. So by telling the story of the, 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 the human person who we regard as the founder of our religion, then we give some kind of form and um, some kind of concreteness to, to these kind of abstract notions like emptiness and so on and so forth. And the Buddha's life is told in uh, a way which is quite deliberately um, uh, smoothed and shaped, polished. It's not full of the biographical details, personal quirks that we 
we come to expect these days if we read a modern biography we want to read about you know a person's habits and their peculiarities what makes them distinctive when we come to read the Buddha's biography then those kinds of things are very strikingly lacking what we find is a very universalized story a myth a myth which tells of the origins of the Buddhist religion through the life of the Buddha so of course when we say something is a myth then that tells us nothing about the truth content of what we're talking about now some people like to specialize in like sifting out so this is one of the things that textual uh, historians do is we take you know the legends and so on which we've inherited from ancient times and we sift through and we say well this bit's likely to be historically correct and this bit is likely to not be and so on and so forth and then we 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 we, we try to reconstruct what might have been uh, the actual human life which underlies the myth so that's one one um, process you know important process to go through and when we do that and when that's been done in modern times uh, one of the findings has been that that in a sense resurrects the humanity of the Buddha in a similar way if you're familiar with the the uh, uh, process that's been going on in in Christianity with the reassessment of the life of Jesus that in a sense has re re reaffirmed the humanity of Jesus and uh, <clears throat> this was uh, brought out once I was reading the biography of Bishop Spong and he was talking about how he did a series of dialogues with a Jewish rabbi and um, over the course of these dialogues and, and discussions of course the great sticking point the great difference between the Christian and Jewish religions is about the nature of Jesus and particularly is Jesus just a prophet as the Jews see him or is he a embodiment of the divine as the Christians see him and uh, as they went on talking the more and more they talked the more and more they could find in common uh, until Bishop Spong was saying well actually you know even in Christianity you can't say that Jesus is God this is actually formally a heresy in the Catholic Church to say Jesus is God it's a, it's a heresy that was condemned by the early church it's called deism but of course that's what most Christians believe they actually if you ask them they'll say of course Jesus is God and so when Bishop Spong said said this then uh, you know in the context of this theological discussion then of course the um, it was on the radio and then the next morning the tabloids got hold of it and there's like Bishop says Jesus is not God <laughs> and so this is this great scandal is kind of the way that they reduce these things so this is that what we start to do is we start to investigate and find the, the human there The story of the Buddha, of course, starts out with, well, the story of the Buddha really starts out, you know, many countless eons ago. One of the, the Buddha's biography, in a sense, is quite probably the, um, the, the physically largest biography of any human being ever composed. And we have literally hundreds, more than 500, in, even in the Pali tradition, well over 500 stories of the Buddha's past lives supposedly and of course when we add to that all the stories in the northern traditions and all the many hundreds of stories which have been lost then there's probably thousands of stories which are all telling of the Buddha's past lives so that's all part of his biography and we think about it okay we've not only got to tell the story of this life thousands and thousands of past lives we have to tell the story of so this starts to get a bit overwhelming, right? Which I guess is the point. It starts to uh, go beyond. It, it starts to stretch us, and it stretches the boundary of reason. So it breaks open this this idea that we're looking at the life of just an ordinary person. And so this is one of the things we always find with the Buddha's biography is that on the one hand there is this recognition: yes, this is a human being. His name was Siddhartha Gautama. He was born in the city in the park of Lumbini uh, probably about 500 BC 
and he was born in the Sakyan clan. His mother was called Maya, his father was called Sudhodana. He was brought up, his mother passed away after seven days. He was brought up by his foster mother and auntie, um, Mahapajapati Gotami, in the city of Kapilavattu, uh, married to Yashodhara, and uh, at the age of 29, left home to practice in the forest. Six years later, attained enlightenment at the age of 35, taught for 45 years, and then passed away in the city of Kusinara, or the little town at that time of Kusinara. That's the Buddha's life. Okay. So there's, there's the fact. So we have like a human being there, and we can, as it were, retrace those footprints. We can, to a reasonable degree, uh, establish that the broad outlines of this, this life story is probably true, historically true. Or at least we don't have good reason to think that it's not true. So that's one side. This is the story, the human life of the fellow Siddhartha Gautama. Now, on the other side, then we've got the, um, the, 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 the extremely extravagant and totally over-the-top Bollywood version of the Buddha's life, okay? which we have told again countless times when he was born and the great massive light appeared through the universe and 84,000 devas came down to worship him and the devas received him. And as soon as he was born, he stood up firmly, took seven mighty strides to the north, okay? Not tottering little steps of a baby. Even, even, to, even for a newborn baby to take tottering steps would have been remarkable enough. But this one, it uses the Satapada Vitihara. It's, a, it's an extremely rare and, and like doubly intensive form in the Pali where it says it's, it could only translate it as a mighty stride. Okay, so seven, seven mighty strides to the north, stands firmly on his two feet, surveys the four directions, and then roars out with the voice of a bull, I am the greatest, I am the eldest, I am the foremost. This is my last birth. I'm not going to get reborn again. So that must have caused a bit of consternation. <laughs> <laughs> At the time, you imagine, oh, this is an unusual child, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, and many, these, these kinds of stories can be read on, on, on many ways. Okay, so, you know, from a, a traditional perspective, uh, then immediately, if, if it says that this happened in an ancient text, then that's what must have happened, okay? If it said that the world, there was an earthquake over the whole world when the Buddha was born, then there must have been an earthquake, okay? And uh, if it said that the great light appeared in the sky, there must have been a great light appeared in the sky. So this is one way of thinking about it. And this is, you know, this is like almost like a naive uh, literalism to, to sort of insist on things, these things being absolutely true. In, in my opinion... Uh, this has been one of my, 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 my great interests for, for much of my life has been looking at ancient myths and stories of, of ancient people and how they gave meaning to them. When we look at old myth, we're looking at a kind of way of talking and way of telling stories which is, lies before this this distinction of or the arising of the idea of history okay so these days we can we we divide things we divide writing into fiction and non-fiction yeah so we, we have these kind of neat distinctions which of course once you start to investigate it is not really that neat at all i mean just about any fiction writer is going to be putting events and so on, details from their own life into it how can you avoid doing that yeah similarly any non-fiction writer is going to be putting their own personal perspective on things. So you, we think that we have fiction and non-fiction, but really they're quite blurred, the boundary between them. 
And in, in ancient times, that, that, bound, that distinction hadn't been made at all. Okay? There wasn't those, you know, if you walked into a library, well, they didn't have libraries in those days, but if you walked into a library, you wouldn't find it divided in that kind of way, into fiction and non-fiction. And so one of the, the, one of the problems for us, looking back at those times, is that we tend to read these kinds of categories into the things of that time. So, so we look at a myth and we say, well, it's either fiction or non-fiction. If it's pretending to be true, then it's pretending to be history. It's non-fiction. But it's false. Okay? It's pretending that these things happen, but they didn't really happen. So therefore it's wrong. Okay? So it's bad history. That's how we, we tend to read this into it. Okay, so this is like a modernist kind of critique, which is very popular, say, 19th century, the first part of the 20th century. They looked at these things and they critiqued them and they said, this thing's pretending to be true, but it's not really true. Okay? And then as, uh, as time went on and people were looking at these myths more deeply, then we started to appreciate that that's, a, that's a, a kind of a reductionist way of looking at it. The people in those times weren't thinking of it as history. They'd never heard of history. They didn't know what history was. And, and no way of knowing that. Okay? The tools for making those distinctions simply weren't there. So, for example, if we want to ask, was the Trojan War real? Okay? Greeks went over to Troy and tried to fight and bring back Helen and so on. Was there a war? At the, well, we can go and send the archaeologists out, dig up the ground and see was there a city there. Okay? So we can compare the myth with the facts and then critique that. And people in those days didn't have those tools so they couldn't make those kinds of distinctions. So these, this idea of myth, these mythic stories, it embodies a sense of truth or a sense of meaning which doesn't make that distinction between things that factually occurred and things which things which must have occurred. This is one of the things that has been coming um, apparent to me by looking in, in Buddhism, the way Buddhist texts were, were, worked. That, that a lot of them come from this, this uh, idea of the cycles of time and the cycles of, of uh, life and death and so on. And when we understand the cycles of life and death, we don't necessarily need to know the facts of what happened because we can infer that this is what must have happened. If the Buddha was really the world teacher, he was the awakened one. He was the illumined one who shone his light over the whole world. Then it must have been the case that this manifested as a miracle at the time of his birth and that light appeared over the whole world. Okay, this is a way of mythic thinking. We find it hard to believe in miracles these days. We've seen too many on TV. We know how easily they are to fake them. I was in Canberra uh, last, uh, earlier in the year and I was teaching this, this group of kids. They were about six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And I said to them, Do mo are monsters real? You know, these, these are only kids. Are monsters real? I was stunned. I was shocked. I was appalled. They were arguing with each other. Monsters aren't real. They were saying, and someone was saying, yes, they are. I said, no, they're not. Growing up so fast, they say, oh, they're that young, and they say, oh, already believe that monsters aren't real. I didn't ask them about Father Christmas. So, the l magic light, see, see, that light appears in the world when the Buddha is born, okay, is a miracle. The whole universe is illumined with this radiance greater than a supernova. And even so great that in those abysmal, ghastly blacknesses of interstellar space, intergalactic space, 
beings are re reborn there and they can see each other for the first time they know, oh, there are other beings born here. There are other beings born here. So, of course, from a scientific point of view, are beings existing in, in deep interstellar space? Well, I don't know, but we did get a new scientist just, just a few weeks ago which talked about this idea of Boltzmann brains, which are brains which, according to quantum probabilistic theory, are supposed to appear spontaneously in intergalactic space. Because space is so big that no matter how improbable it is, it's going to happen because it's just too big. It's going to happen eventually. So maybe this is what that's talking about. But So in the one sense, we have this cosmic miracle. But on the other hand, what you have is something which is totally mundane. If you switch the perspective around, it's totally ordinary. What's happened? A baby has been born. What's happened from that baby's perspective? Well, they've been in darkness, haven't they? Their world has been in darkness for nine months. Gradually, their consciousness is evolving. Gradually, they're becoming more aware of what's going on around them. But all they've ever known is darkness. And suddenly, they are born into this world of light. And suddenly, they realize, oh, other beings exist here too. Yeah? So, always when we're looking at myths, we always need to look at it in different perspectives. One, one trick to remember when looking at these stories is that the outside of myths is our inside. Okay? What looks, characters in myths don't have an inner life. Okay? In real myths. This is how we know when, when myths is turning into fiction, when the authors invent inner lives for their characters. Okay? They're trying to get inside and imagine what that's like and then try to project thoughts and emotions on the characters. But in real myths, characters have a very v vacant inner life. All we can see is their outside. And that's because their outside is our inside. When we're looking at what they're doing, we're actually looking at the contents of our own mind, of our own experience. And so this, this birth of the Buddha, this appearance of the light on the one hand is you know, an unprecedented cosmic miracle. And on the other hand is just this very normal phenomenon which happens thousands of times every day. The emergence of the newborn infant into the light. So what kind of person was the Buddha as a young boy when he's growing up? What kind of um, games did he play? We don't know all that much. In fact, we know very little. What we do have is you know, the later legends which fill out all the, the conventional details of the, the, the great hero. And of course, the Buddha's life story follows very much the, the uh, pattern of the hero myth. So, for example, one of the items in a hero myth is that there has to be a, uh, a, a youthful display of strength. So, for example, Hercules, even when he's in his cot as a baby, uh, strangled two snakes, great pythons that were sent to kill him. And he just strangled them and then just uh, sat there laughing in his cot. So this is one of the things that heroes have to do. So in a similar way, <clears throat> for example, one story where the Buddha having uh, his rivalry with Devadatta and uh, uh, Devadatta killed an elephant. He was so strong he could kill an elephant with a single blow. Of course, the Buddha wouldn't do anything nasty like that, right? Devadatta hits the elephant on the head, boom, it drops down dead. That's how powerful Devadatta was. The Buddha then picks up, you know, he's only a kid, he's only like eight or nine or ten or something, picks up the carcass of the elephant and then tosses it about 20 or 30 miles. 
okay? And it lands and forms a great lake where it lands. So that's how powerful and mighty he was. And of course, he wins all the competitions and so on. For the marriage competition, again, classic element in myth. They have to sort of do the archery and so on and so forth. And he wins all of these. So this is the, the, the developed story. But in terms of what we actually know about him, we know, firstly, we know that his mother died early which is quite interesting, isn't it? I think I always say that's very interesting detail. They say it was after seven days. So, you know, it's not um, un, unfeasible or not, not uh, uh, improbable to think that the, you know, the Buddha, even as a young child, was an exceptionally perceptive, intelligent, uh, and sensitive infant. And, uh, you know, just, just after making those bonds with the mother, then suddenly she's just not there anymore. And what kind of impact that does that have on the Buddha's mind, on the young Siddhartha's mind? Is planting this, this seed of loss, this seed of somehow the vanishing of what is loved at such an early age. It's right, it's just, just in there. It's so deep that it couldn't even be thought of or acknowledged. So deep that it's just there as, as like a pattern waiting to be expressed or waiting to be realized at a later time. And of course this is the 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 you know the overarching, overwhelming theme of the Buddha's life is the the the, um, the the pain of loss, the pain of impermanence and death, and all of these kinds of things, and right up to the Buddha's passing away in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, you know, he's reflecting constantly on these themes of loss, passing away, separation, and so it seems to me that uh, this must have been a tremendous influence for him. the loss of his mother, you know, that's just on a, on a human level. You know, thinking p purely as, as a human being, you know, forgetting the, the mythic context for the time being, but purely as a human being, just that experience of loss, that sort of deep tragedy which informed the Buddha's whole life. Of course, on a mythic level, then, then uh, Maya, the Buddha's mother, also can be understood as uh, uh, it's like a, a, a sacrificial motif, sacrifici the sacrifice of the goddess. She's the one, the creator. And of course the word maya in uh, Indian uh, thought means illusion. Yeah? So she is the Mahamaya, the great illusion, Maya Devi, the queen of illusion. Yeah, or the goddess of illusion, Maya Devi. And so she's created the world for him. Yeah? This world in which he's born. That world of the 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 um uh, uh you know, the aristocratic life that the Buddha enjoyed as a young man. She brought him into this and created this thing. So that her death the death of Maya is like the death of the dream, the death of the illusion, the exposure of the the impermanence and the fallacy of the the, the illusory nature of life. So, in that sense, she can be seen as being the Buddha's first teacher. This kind of um, uh, that, that, that kind of teaching which is much more important than, you know, a literal teaching, you know. The things, that, the experiences of life that we learn from that teach us so much more than anything we might learn in a school or a college. This is the, what Mahamaya was teaching. So as opposed to the Buddha's father, of course, who was always uh, trying to keep him trapped, 
stop him from going forth, imprison him. And uh, so maya, in that sense, maya can be seen as the, the vehicle of the Buddha's liberation. Suddhodana was the, the force trying to entrap him. <clears throat> so that's one of the details we know about the Buddha's early life. The other detail we know is, of course, that he sat meditation one time uh, under the jambu tree, the rose apple tree. And... Uh, Jambu is a very, uh, you know what jambu is? It's a very uh, fragrant fruit. I've seen it a couple of times in um, Malaysia uh, where they grow it and, and it has a smell of almost like rose water or something like that and a uh, very, very beautiful fragrance. So he was sitting there quietly under this rose apple tree. His father was off working somewhere and then spontaneously sat down and went into first jhana. And this particular incident is recognized in right through the Buddhist tradition uh, in the scriptures of all the different schools of Buddhism. So this is one of those events which is on the borderline between something which may be considered mythical and may be considered real. On the one hand, we think that, you know, that's not what kids do. Kids don't sort of sit down you know, and then get into jhanas, or do they? How come we have to go and practice meditation and go to all these retreats and do all this hard work to get into jhanas and not even, even then we can't do it half the time? Or if, And yet he was able to just sit down under a tree. What's going on? We have all the advantages of learning all the meditation techniques. He didn't know any meditation techniques. Was that, was that an advantage or a disadvantage, not knowing meditation techniques? Perhaps that's the real way to make our meditation work, is to get rid of the meditation techniques. You know? Sit down there under the, under the rose apple tree. And there's something very, very deeply profound about that, which we really need to remember for our own meditation practice. The Buddha had not done a 10-day meditation course. right? He had not heard of the four jhanas. He had not heard of vipassana jhanas. He had not heard of kanaka samadhi, upachara samadhi, apana samadhi. He had not heard of the five hindrances. He had not heard of the 16 steps of Breath meditation. He didn't have any of that stuff to get in the way of his mind becoming peaceful. And that's something that's really, really important to, to bear in mind. You don't find success in meditation by doing meditation techniques. This is one of the great uh, fallacies of the way that we tend to approach meditation in modern times. We think that we can go and do a meditation technique and get the results of it. It doesn't happen. If we approach our meditation with that kind of thinking, we're just going to end up more and more deluded. Meditation is not something you can do. It's not something you can follow a technique. It's not something you can get results. Meditation, any kind of meditation, no matter what you're doing, samatha, vipassana, whatever you're doing, it's about letting go. And it's one, you know, one of the interesting things about the, the Thai forest tradition is that <clears throat> they're very thin on meditation techniques. And, uh, for example, when I was in uh, staying with uh, Ajahn Dun, one of the great uh, students of Ajahn Chah, very widely regarded as being an enlightened monk, whether that's true or not, I can't say, but this is his reputation. 
uh, and he uh, it was interesting listening to him teach meditation, you know, and uh, on on the one hand it was deeply unsatisfactory, and uh, you know his teaching every every day he would give a teaching the lay people would come and offer food at the meal time and every day his teaching would be practice generosity, give give dana, keep the five precepts. And uh, when you have some free time, then sit down, meditation, watch your breath going in and out, make your mind peaceful. That's it. That absolutely, that's all. Every day, the same. One, two, <laughs> no variations, no spinning it out, no stories, no elaborations, no details. Just that every day. So on the one hand, it's it's very frustrating. On the other hand, you've got to think, well. It's probably works, you know, if you actually do do that, then uh, you're probably going to get the results. And when people would ask him, I remember one time there was a, um, uh, one of the Western monks who was staying there and his mother visited and she was asking questions about meditation and uh, he recommended that she do meditation on death. And uh, again, very, why? Very simple. She said she had a problem with tiredness in meditation, the classic Antidote to tiredness in Buddhist meditation manuals, you read in Visuddhimagga and other places, is death meditation. Okay? We know we're going to die. It wakes us up. Okay? Just like if you're in a house, it's burning down. It's like really burning down. It's not just an alarm going. You may be sleepy, but no matter how sleepy you are, you're going to wake up yeah? and you're going to run out of the house. If you, that fear of death, if it's real in you, will wake you up. So this is a classic antidote. So... Again, she asked, she had this problem, what's the solution? And he gives the classic answer, death meditation. And then she says, how do I do death meditation? He says, well, you just have to reflect that this body inevitably will die, it will pass away, it will break up. And then when you reflect in that way, then that will give rise to that feeling of uh, urgency and that feeling of, of um, needing to to um, needing to wake up, needing to be alive and to, to make the best of the ti- our time here. <clears throat> and she, she asked, well, how do I do that? You know, what, what technique did I use? You know, because she'd come from a Western background, was used to learning about meditation techniques. And he said, well, you just have to find your own way to, give, to make that feeling arise for yourself. And that's all. That's all he would say. So this is very, very characteristic of the, the Thai tradition. So this is why you don't find, from the Thai forest tradition, you know, such you know, an emphasis on the, you know, such recognizable sort of meditation techniques and so on, and the use of technical language and so on is very loose. I remember one of my favorite passages of Ajahn Chah, and he was saying he doesn't like to talk about jhanas, because he said when you, when you start talking about jhanas and people just get concerned about levels and attainments and getting this and getting that and, and it gets a bit of a distraction. He just likes to talk about the peaceful mind. He said, well, anyway, there's like the first stage of the peaceful mind. It has five factors. Vitaka, vichara, piti, sukha, ekagata. Of course, the first the five factors of the first jhana. So he's talking about the same thing, but he just doesn't like to use the word jhana. He uses the word peaceful mind. So we don't get hung up on it, and so this is again this way of talking is very typical of the the Thai tradition. So that's you know I don't want to don't want to say that that that's right or wrong. It's just another way of looking at it, and it's one which you can certainly see is in tune with the way these meditations are presented in the in the early suttas. Of course, you know meditation techniques and so on have their place, and as you all know that. You know, I, I also teach meditation techniques and so on. The lack of uh, structure within the Thai meditation tradition also can be uh, a problem for people. So I'm not trying to say one way is better than another, but there is a one aspect of the truth, one perspective on the truth, is this realization that actually sitting under the rose apple tree, in the cool shade of the rose apple tree, while other people have gone off to work. 
and just being peaceful with that. That's, that's the ultimate meditation technique. In a sense, that's all you need. So, of course, this was this um, moment or this experience which the Buddha um, uh, later recollected just before the time of his enlightenment. But before that, of course, he had to go through the whole process of you know, being married, having all his you know, family and everything, and having a son and then leaving home. <clears throat> so, of course, this is um, very challenging, isn't it? He's, he's the world's first wife deserter. Should we be worshipping somebody like that? Is that worthy of homage? What would, what would you do? Mabel? If Rohan was to decide, okay, I'm going to go off and get enlightened. I'm going to sneak out of the house in the middle of the night. Bye-bye. You can look after the kid. Would you say, oh, sadhu, 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 you can, you're the world teacher. I'm going to bow down in homage to you. Uh, yeah, I mean, those, those things are all true, but is, I mean, I'm interested in the different ways you can look at it, like, like what, you know, the way that you're talking about it, right? You want to make it reasonable, what the Buddha did, yeah? Which is fine, maybe it was reasonable. But the other way of looking at it is to say that it's, it's the very unreasonableness of it, which is what makes it powerful. And that's the whole point of it. The point of it is that he was transgressing what was the greatest norms of his society, which was to have a family and bring up a son. Okay, so if you're in the, in the Dharma Shastras and so on, then having a son and so on was the greatest, basically the point of your life. Not having a daughter, of course. It's a bit of a disaster, really. But, so it's the other way of looking at it. I mean, I think, I think what you're saying is true, that, that in a sense, obviously, the, the family unit was different. It wasn't so much a, a, um, a nuclear family, it's an extended family. But also, it was still very transgressive. Uh, you know, if we look in the Vedas and things, and it's always talking about the, the um, uh, you know, having a family and so on is the, is the, the highest value there, having descendants. So, that's one of the things that makes a story powerful, yeah? Because it wrenches your guts out, yeah? It doesn't allow you to say, yes, the Buddha was the kind of fellow who, you know, he's like a kind of vicar who you would sit around and have a cup of tea in the afternoon with, yeah? He left his wife and family in the middle of the night and went off and, and, and tortured himself until he was almost dead, until he was, you know, he was eating cow dung, right? This is a fellow we put up on our shrine and worship him, a man who ate cow dung as a spiritual practice. Somehow, and, and, there, and there, has to, there has to be a, 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 a wrench, there has to be some kind of dramatic change or shift to actually lift you out, you know, to completely revalue what your life is. That's what Nietzsche talked about, the revaluation of all values. Yeah? And so you're seeing things from a different kind of perspective. Yeah? And uh, so that takes a bit of energy. So in that, a lot of energy. In a, in a storytelling mode, that's how you do that. Yeah? You create those dramatic shifts by that kind of node, that, that, that event that says, here he is leaving his wife and family, going out. And of course, the more beautiful his wife is, the more that they love each other, the more that the family was wonderful and the son was wonderful and the more he had everything, then the more powerful it is when he leaves. Yeah? So it is important to remember this kind of, the Buddha wasn't a tame monk. Yeah? Even later in his life, he would just, when the, the monks were all arguing or something, he'd just say, that's it. Get his bowl and robes, walk out. Go and live in the middle of the forest by himself. Yeah, just with the wild animals, with the elephants and the monkeys and the tigers. Yeah? He wasn't a domesticated monk. 
He didn't have a mobile phone. <laughs> he didn't need one. He, And so there's something about his life, this is like the dedication of his life and the integrity of his life, which is a, a perennial challenge, you know, a constant challenge. And this is not something which just we see or we think of, but something which has been uh, part of the ongoing um, uh, uh, engagement with this story through the Buddhist traditions. Just to give one example... You know, I said before, just a minute ago, that the, the hero myth is usually the, the bloke who, who, who goes forth and does everything. Now, one of the stories about this was in the, in the Mulda Sarvastivada Vini. It talks about how after he'd gone forth, that Yashodara, still staying at home, his wife, still staying at home, went through much the same experiences that he did, yeah? doing the ascetic practices and things like that, that he did while she was... Uh, he was gone forth, but she did them at home. So she was like paralleling. There's this parallelism of the, the two careers of, 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 of the Buddha and his wife. And, and she actually remained pregnant for the whole six-year period of the Buddha's striving. Okay? So she carried Rahula in her womb for six years, and only when the Buddha became enlightened was she able to give birth to Rahula. That's in the in the Pali tradition, yes. Yeah. So this is uh, this is a much later tradition. The Mula Savastivada, It's like a thousand, maybe five hundred, a thousand years after the Buddha. So it's not a historical tradition, but it shows you like that a, d a different way that they are trying to address that issue. They are obviously concerned about this issue. What's the Buddha doing? He's gone off. He's left his family. And what does that mean? Yeah. So the relationship between the one gone forth and the family he's left behind. So in a sense, they're trying to develop this that story that would give give some, bring back some balance, perhaps. Perhaps it felt that was it in lack of balance. To come back to that thing of Rahula, I mean, as it's told in the the Pali Canon, he went back to visit his family. Yashodara says to Rahula, "Go and ask for your inheritance." And uh, so he goes, and and then. Rahula was supposed to be about I think seven or something at the time, and he said. Your shadow is pleasant, monk. Very interesting little phrase that, your shadow is pleasant. It kind of always strikes me as being quite, you know, the kind of thing that a kid would say. It's a bit kind of unexpected, you know, uh, but kind of capturing that kind of moment. And then he sort of says, well, he says he wants his inheritance. So he says, okay, well, Ananda, give him, the, give him the going forth, make him into a novice, so they take him off. That's his inheritance. Well, Yashoda is like, what the... And uh, anyway, she became a bhikkhuni and became an arahant as well, of course. And so all ended up happily. But we see, we don't, we don't know anything about what happened after that. We don't, what happened, did, did Yashoda and Rahula meet or talk after that? Did they have any kind of relation or ongoing connection? We don't really know. We can imagine, but we don't really know. Uh, not sure. His, 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 Rahul is one of these uh, whose death is not recorded in the early tradition so that uh, the later traditions could play around with it pretty freely. So according to some of the northern traditions, and this is still current in China, uh, he's actually still alive. <laughs> he's still alive. And you can meet him if you're very lucky. In China, in China yeah. And uh, so sometimes people will meet, the, you know, they'll be going along and then they'll meet this kind of really ancient monk with kind of eyebrows that come down to the ground and stuff like that. And, and, uh, and that's Rahula. Yeah, so he's supposed to be one of the uh, long-lived arahants. So these things all, 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 all come around in a cycle. And, uh, you know, can't go into too much detail now, but just to, to round it off, of course, the Buddha, after his striving, he reaches enlightenment, reaches what he was looking for teaches and then comes to his, his uh, passing away. And it's told in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, very, very beautiful uh, text 
this the kind of the um, the rhythm, the flow of this text is very stately, like this kind of grand river that's flowing, like flowing almost like the Ganges River. And it's kind of moving towards its inevitable conclusion of the Buddha's passing away, step by step, very unhurried, very beautiful uh, text. And... Uh, <coughs> And and one of the things about the Mahaparinibbana Sutta is obviously has a very deep mythic resonance. It tells that that the whole ending of the cycle, which embodies that the truth which we've learned from the beginning of the cycle, the Buddha's mother passing away, the inevitability of separation, pain, and loss, and the Buddha constantly reiterating these things to his followers. So this whole cycle of the Buddha's life and the meaning of his teachings is being reiterated in this kind of grand um, narrative. But as well as that, as well as that kind of rounding sense in which it kind of closes the arc of the whole of the Buddha, early Buddhist scriptures, it also has uh, a sense of vividness which is often lacking from many other texts. You know, we see the Buddha um, warming his back in the sun and Ananda commenting on, on his, his looking aged, his, his body's wrinkled. Yeah? And then he, Buddha says this kind of famous saying, is his body is just like a, a cart that's kept going strapped up. We're not even really sure what it means. It seems to mean like a, an old cart that's falling apart and they kind of wrap some leather straps around to keep it going, hold it together. I'm not really sure even what the words mean. And uh, it's a very kind of idiomatic phrase. So in these little glimpses, it seems to me that we're, we're, we're seeing something which is quite a kind of a vivid moment from the Buddha's life. It seems to me that that text, the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, uh, is speaking from a position relatively close to the events that it's actually describing. Okay? It's, not, it's, not, it's not told by someone who's too distant from them. It's told by someone who perhaps was actually there, perhaps Ananda, who actually put that text together since he features in it all the time. And it has that kind of, just that, that, that hint of that, that, that um, uh, real-life connection there. So it has those both aspects very strongly. And so the Buddha's passing away, and then again, of course, the, the uh, earthquakes and all of the, the so on associated with the Buddha's passing away the mythic resonance, the closing of the circle. Yeah? And one of the, the uh, uh, one of the interesting dynamics that comes out or that, that like spins off of that is in a sense the Buddha's life is now completed. You know, that, that circle is closed, but Buddhism is just starting. Yeah? So it's almost got like a to be continued, yeah. At the end of it, you know, we're sort of waiting for you know Buddhism part two, you know, with the sec- the sequel, right? What's going to happen next? This bit, this story is finished, and what's happening next? And so, there it seemed to me that there was this tremendous fear there from the Buddha's life, from, sorry, from the Buddha's death. You know, we it's depicted very graphically in the stories of the Buddha's death where. Half of them are rolling around on the floor, weeping and wailing and crying out, Alas, all too soon the eye of the world has vanished. All too soon the eye of the world has disappeared. And so this, this, this um, despair, this, this distress at, at knowing that the Buddha's gone. And then on the other hand, the Arahants, who were like, you know, just chill, man. This is just what happens. Stuff passes away. And so this is this is kind of dichotomy, almost like this schizophrenic uh, aspect in the Buddhist tradition. And I think that 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 difference has few has been has has created this dynamic, which has actually fueled the the ongoing development of the whole Buddhist tradition. I can't, can't go into that too much, but just to see, just to notice that that fueling 
that cycle so that within in one respect we are each of us um, in our own way in our own spiritual path uh, finding some kind of resonance from the Buddha's life finding some kind of meaning which reflects within our own lives within our own stories yeah so in a sense we're embodying that universal cycle but in another sense we're also engaging in a very personal activity and a personal uh, individual unique activity which has got uh, its own set of particular historical and psychological and cultural circumstances which will work in a, in a different way than the life of the Buddha. So by bearing both of these things in mind, the particular, the historical, the individual, and then the the universal, the mythic, the spiritual, then it seems to me by, by looking at both of these signs, balancing both of these signs, this is how we find the, the deepest or most um, uh, important meaning and resonance of the Buddha's life story.